You will only find those things being born out of doctrine and true biblical theology. Or else we've just got emptiness. We've got a, a type of morality for us. And that's the last thing that we want in this church. And so what you find is that throughout the writings of James, that he is, time and time again, he's establishing the very doctrine of truth. And on that basis, he's reminding the people of God as to what true religion is all about. That's why it has a very practical slant upon it for that reason and to that very end. What is also very important to keep in mind is that throughout the letter, James is addressing the child of God. So while you can say there are certainly points of application to those who are not saved, there is great error in trying to apply certain portions in James to those who are not saved. We will enter into all sorts of realms of confusion. In fact, David and I were speaking about this uh, the other day. We were in front of the vehicle, the others were uh, behind, and so we can talk to our heart's content. And we were dealing with these various things. Uh, and if I was to deal with this particular subject, the, the sin of partiality, apart from Christ, apart from the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, if it was something merely for any person to think about, then, well, we don't really have a message for this evening. You know, you can go into any establishment, any building, a community centre, a school, a workplace, and you can deal with these things of not having favouritism towards people. You don't have to have the gospel. You can teach that in a certain form. What James is doing is that he's emphasising the Christian should view this as they are redeemed in Christ. And that adds a, an altogether different angle and perspective to this message. So he says in verse 1, doesn't he, in James 2, he says, my brethren. Again, that generic term, referring to brethren and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we find that throughout the letter, he, he does this very self-same thing. Again, in verse 5, hearken, my beloved brethren. And there he has more of an affection and more of a desire and more of a love towards the Christian. So it's only the child of God, it's only those who know Christ, whoever can be qualified as being brethren or being sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, it is brethren according to the faith, if you go through uh, the letter of James. So these things are very important. So what is he dealing with now? He is warning against this sin that is a prevalent sin. And it's one that we all have to be very wary against and very careful not to commit. The sin of partiality, favoritism, discrimination in a biblical sense, not just in a general worldview sense, but in a biblical context or whatever we wish to call that particular word. Now, James says something at the beginning that we should try to qualify and explain, because it doesn't read necessarily the best for our, our understanding in our present day. So look at verse 1. It says, Brethren, or my brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect to persons. Now, the first glance of that verse might confuse you. Is James saying, don't have the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, of course, we know that's not what James is suggesting at all. If I can paraphrase it, I don't have the time to explain all the, the reasons why, but we can deal with it later on. If I paraphrase the verse, what he's saying, in effect, is this. He's saying, don't say you believe in Christ. Don't say that you are a Christian. Don't say you're a child of God. In other words, don't profess or don't say you have the faith. That's what he means by that opening sentence. And that's a theme that James deals with right through, beginning to end. Faith without works is dead. That's his message. Don't go around saying you have it. And it all the time, you're respecting one person and shunning another person. Because that's not the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the best way I could try to explain the opening verse. And then he deals with it in more detail. What does he look at? First of all this. James's example. He gives us an example of what we mean by partiality within the church. Now I know straight away, when we look at this example, we might say, well in our 21st century, in 2016, do we ever see this happening? No, I probably would have to say, it is a rare occasion. We're not going to find many occasions when this type of behaviour 
is going to take place. But what we do, we understand why James gives the example, and then we learn the principle. And we try to make sure that we don't find ourselves guilty of committing this sin of partiality. So what does James do? He paints a scene. Or he presents a picture that was a real problem in their particular day and age. He gives us the usage of the word assembly. For if they come unto your assembly, in the Greek it's synagogue. So we're dealing here, of course, with worship. Just like we are this evening, or this morning, or throughout the week. And he paints the picture of maybe, I I don't know what type of language to use, but maybe a multi-millionaire. Maybe someone more, a a, a multi-billionaire. But someone of tremendous wealth. And I want to stress straight away something. It's not just that the person has wealth. It is much more, as we shall see. But they step into a place of worship. They, they are maybe uh, dressed in the finest. They have the best of all the things that it possibly could be. The idea is that James is suggesting someone that is outwardly covered in wealth and, and, and more than this, covered in the acclaim of the world. It's not just they have the wealth, which in itself is not a simple thing, but they are glorying in their wealth. They are boasting in their wealth. They love how they look and how they are. And they come striding with a sense of arrogance into the very house of God. And then behind that same person walks the extreme opposite. And I want to stress this, it is the extreme opposite. If I can say the epitome of what we might view poverty to be and again let's remember he's not dealing with just someone who is hard up and he's not dealing with someone that maybe has a bit of a financial problem why do we know that well look at the language that James uses in verse 2 he says at the end and they're coming also a poor man in vile that's the, the secret to understanding the picture vile clothing if you have a margin it will say filthy clothing You have someone who is steeped in filth. You have someone whose very life itself suggests that they are the lowest of the low. They have nothing they could possibly contribute. And they reject it. That they hate it. And for that very reason. James gives us a a picture. He says, well, if if those two people come in and you take hold of the Mr. Moneybags, well, Mrs. Moneybags, as it might be, I don't want to be accused of inequality in my illustration. So, uh, Mr. or Mrs. Moneybags, and they come into the church, and you, you disregard the other individual. That's the problem that you have. And that's the example that he is painting. Now, let's develop this, because there are things that we need to consider in the subject. So, we need to understand the position. It's important that you get your mind around the people that James is describing, because you could be guilty of misinterpreting James's words here. Again, I've said it already, I'll say it again. He is not condemning the wealthy. And he is not elevating the not so wealthy. You know, sometimes we might be very quick to say, well, you know, God is not con- uh, uh, condemning the wealthy, but he is favouring the poor. And I want to make it clear, the gospel while we should look at it in a a bit more detail towards the end, the gospel is not saying it only favours the poor. I believe there's a sense in which it tends to be the gospel has more of an impact upon those who realise they have nothing, but that's a different subject altogether. But there's a problem that is taking place within the church in James' time. You see, in the early church especially, they went through times of great poverty. You know that what we have, even ourselves as a small fellowship, and and, you know, if I I think of ourselves, then you think further afield, and you think maybe of bigger churches and what they have, my, what a difference we are to the church in James' time. I was only reading an article where it always seems to be a church in America, they they do these things, and they had, at the very front, they had, you know, leather seats, reclining seats, they had the option of, you know, drinks and food and all, this was a Church meant to be a place of worship. And these were VIP seats. I don't know how you become a VIP. Uh, it sounds like a good thing. I might try and uh, apply and go over there myself for a, a bit of a break. But, of course, I'm only being uh, silly when I, when I say that. But what a, an atrocious thing that is. 
Imagine having VIP seats in the place of worship. And all of it, of course, is to be user-friendly. But, but what sort of impact does it have upon everyone else? Because every week it's someone else. They're the most important person. We favour them. We give to them. And we just put everyone else at the back. We don't really want to know who they are. Now, I'm not saying it's the same situation, but the church in Jerusalem in James' time, they were suffering great poverty. And maybe it was in the extreme, we could say, so that if someone came in who was wealthy, you know, to the eye, maybe there were gold rings, maybe the the clothing itself was suggestive of the wealth which they had, and, and that would be a great temptation because these poor believers, these believers that were suffering in so many respects, say, well, you know, that can be our benefactor. If we can make sure this individual is is comfortable in the place of worship, then we're going to be fine just as we are. Because we're not going to really benefit if someone else comes in who doesn't have much to give. And while that type of extreme situation is probably not the case in the West, there might be that type of thinking that happens. It may well be the type of thinking in in churches where there is a favouring and there is a, if I can use the expression, a chumming up towards those who potentially are able to give more and are putting to one side those who can't give or just give what they can. What an indictment that upon the church and it's probably a, a, a sin which is still with us in many respects. Let's define what we mean again by these riches. James' picture of this rich man was not the likes of Abraham. Abraham was a wealthy man, but he was a godly man. So again, the two things are not mutually exclusive. Remember in Luke chapter 7, the centurion was a godly man and he actually built a synagogue for the Jews. You know, so a man of great wealth and a man of great influence doesn't really mean that you can't be a man of God at the same time. What we are dealing with here, and it's important to really get hold of this, is the moral description. It's the moral description of the individual. It is their pomp and it's their show and it's their indulgence, we can say. Maybe the, the type of individual that would expect a red carpet to be uh, rolled out. And all the special treatment to be given to them. That's the type of man that James has in mind. So what's the point that he's establishing here? He warns against this type of favoritism. He's not, of course, as I said, dispensing with the fact that a wealthy individual may be a man of God at the same time, but he's dealing with a problem that can arise. Should we have respect then to people? Is James going to the extreme where we should not have a type of respect to individuals because of positions? Well, that's a different subject altogether. We're told to honour the king, aren't we? We're told, of course, to have respect in Proverbs 24, 31. We're told to fear the Lord and the king and meddle not with them that are given to change. 1 Peter 2, 17, honour all men, fear God, honour the king. If we were before the queen, we would show the respect which is due. We're not dealing with that. We're dealing with something altogether different. A type of discrimination and partiality within the church. And again, verse 1, if I just take you back to what that's saying here, is reminding us of this. That is not the faith of Christ. That is not the standard of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, if I just remind you of the meaning of that verse, it speaks about him And all that he is unto us. You know, that's where our eyes should be fixed upon in all the decisions that we make as Christians in the house of God. In fact, if I can say to you that take verse 1 as a a general rule for you, as a general standard for you in your Christian life, take verse 1 and remind yourself that the Christian church and the Christian individual is not interested in different types that we can attract into the house of God. The the individual Christian is interested in demonstrating the faith of Christ and being more and more like unto him. So we see James' example. We see, secondly, James' estimation or what he thinks of partiality among Christians. We need to listen to James here. 
Because you look at how he concludes the whole matter. What does he say? Look at verse 4. He says, Are ye not then partial in yourselves? Even worse, and are become judges of evil thoughts. If you look at verse 6, But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before judgment seats. There are three actions that are seen here that the church is guilty of if we are guilty of partiality. We are guilty, first of all, of wrongly discriminating. Look at verse 4, states that to be guilty of partiality is in fact to be divided in your own thoughts and judgments. What I mean is this, that they were halting between two opinions. They were believing, maybe in one thing, but doing something else altogether different. You see, they preached a type of liberty in the gospel. They preached that in Christ there is liberty for all. But when it came to practical application of the things of God, they were so very different. On the one hand, they would say with Paul in Galatians, there is, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male or female, for you are all one in Christ. But when it came to putting this into practice, well, they were very different. They had their judgments and they had their decisions all made. That's why I'm saying that their, their judgment was... A divided judgment. It was a wrong judgment. There was also division among themselves because while they were professing to depend upon God, by this type of partiality, they were actually looking to man. And you know, Christian, if I can just put this up to date to our present day, we do the very same thing. We go around talking about trusting in God and believing the Lord and, you know, rolling all things unto him, depending upon the Lord. But then we seem to practically live as if we rely upon man to make our way and give us all the things that we need. And there's an inconsistency in that type of Christian behavior. The word partial, it gives us the idea of doubting and, and wavering. So that's why I'm suggesting that very thing. And so we're not to have that type of action. There was also wrong judging or wrongful judgment. He speaks in verse 4 about evil thoughts. He says, are you become, are you to become judges of evil thoughts? Now the Lord Jesus made a similar point, didn't he? Remember the words of John 7, 24. It's often misquoted um, uh, by many people. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. And that really is the sum and summary of that subject. I don't need to preach in judgment because the Lord Jesus says it all there. Don't judge according to the appearance. Now, he doesn't mean this, that you can't judge a book by its cover. You know, that, that saying sometimes is very wrong. You can. Sometimes you can judge a book by its cover. Someone goes around and swearing and cursing and their whole life is ungodly. You can't say, well, actually, if you just look at my heart, I'm a Christian. You know, you, you can judge that cover quite well. You can make a calculated decision and say, well, that life doesn't tally with the gospel. And you're judging by their life, by their outward appearance. So you have to make sure that sort of statement is used in the right setting. The Lord Jesus says, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. And he gives here in James an example of wrong judgment. And it's this sin of partiality. Of course, the Christian must make discerning thoughts. We all do that. And it's quite natural in the Christian life. But here is something altogether different. You know, the Pharisees, they were guilty of this type of thing. Uh, their, their judgment was always carnal, wasn't it? It was always based on what they could see and perceive. There was never any spiritual perception or discernment within them. So much so that they were the type of person that would as Christ maybe would suggest, strain at a gnat and would swallow a camel. They would go a mile and a length to try to condemn someone for the smallest of things while all the time sinning to hell themselves. And the Lord says, well, that's the wrong type of judgment. And again, if a Christian is guilty of that, where they will analyse the minuscule, and make that the major and overlook all the major things and treat them as minuscule. That's a wrong judgment. So all of this comes into the equation here in James chapter 2 about this judgment of evil thoughts. 
and reminds us that we're not to be the type of person if someone comes through the door or even amongst ourselves that we make sweeping assessments and judgments or that we favour in a particular way based on what we see. Careful how we are. And then thirdly, it would lead to wrongful despising. Now this is quite a powerful thought that we're going to finish with in a moment, but look at verse 5. I want to just read verse 5 and then deal with it towards the end. But look at verse 5 me. It says, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith? Now that's a really important verse because what James is doing here, he's building really all of his thoughts around that, that particular theme. As a way of, of, of trying to you know, drive home the main message, that becomes the centre ground. He, he builds all things to that climax that we shall deal with in a moment. But I want to just go to verse 6 quite uh, quickly. He says, but ye have despised the poor. Ye have despised the poor, he says. In other words, by favouring one, it only led to one possible outcome. You are hating the other. And this isn't equal. It isn't fair. It isn't true. It is partiality. And it's sin. And the reason why is because God has chosen the poor. Not every poor person, but in a general sense. Chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith. And this is James' argument. You're despising what God chooses. You see now the gravity of the sin? You see how now when we deal with a type of thing of partiality that you might not think has any place within the church, but it does, that we find ourselves grossly guilty of something that is so grieving to God, you're making judgments and assessments upon those individuals that God may well have chosen heirs of eternal life. If they come through the door, you don't know what God may do with that life. You don't know how God may intervene in that life which is just turned aside by man. God may save that man or that woman. God may clothe them in the righteousness of Christ. And God may turn that individual into a trophy of grace. And you have the audacity to say, you sit there. Rather than to care for their soul. And to love them in Christ. That's not the faith of Christ. Again, we go back to verse 1. And I say to you as Christians and to my own heart, we need to be very careful against this. It may not creep in in such an extent as it did in James's day, but it will show itself. It will show itself in whispers and gossips and slander and motives and intentions and actions. And that's why it's a very key passage in God's word. That brings us to the last thought here. James's evaluation of the rich and poor. It's quite a beautiful expression in verse 5. Hearken, listen. My beloved brethren, hath not God. You know how well we would do as Christians if any time before we spoke or did anything, we took that very simple statement and we allowed it to qualify all our thoughts and all our actions. Hath not God. What has God done? What has God done? What has God allowed to be true within the church of Christ? What is God's choice? What is the very action of God? Uh, how mistaken we are and how much error we make as Christians because what we do is, well, what are they doing? And what are people doing? And what are others doing? No, the very premise of James is this, hath not God. And that, my friend, becomes our influence. That is our dictate. That drives us. That shows us the very type of people that we should be. And notice the tone of his writing and the advice here. What compassion James has. What love he shows here. What care for individuals who come through the house of God. And he draws the greatest of all illustrations. The choosing of the poor to be rich in faith it's almost a mirror image of what we have at the very beginning with the rich man coming in who's not an heir of grace and again it's important that we know exactly what James is saying here 
In other words, the poor are not saved because they're poor. That would be a, a very um, wrong type of theology to adopt in your mind. I, I, I don't want to suggest for any minute that God saves people because they are poor. Just like God doesn't save because someone's rich. It has nothing to do with it. But rather we can say that it seems to be the very practice of God according to his purpose and, and his will that he chooses the poor in this world to be rich in faith. Think of the 12 apostles. Were they men of wealth? Were they men of substance? They weren't. They were men of a humble background and beginning. Even our Lord Jesus Christ who is the King of glory. Who is God over all, blessed forever. He came onto this earth. He became man. He takes humanity. But remember, he takes humanity as a Nazarene. He takes the lowest place. He humbles himself to the very depth, we could say. He doesn't choose to enter into our life and our world as a king upon a throne in an earthly capacity. He has no home. He has nowhere to lay his head. He has earthly parents and guardians who have nothing in this world. They are poor. They are homeless. They have nothing. That's what our Savior chooses. And do you not think there's a pattern there in what he chooses when it comes to the salvation of the lost? And maybe this is something that should encourage us because just imagine if the gospel favored only the wealthy. What a hopeless message it would be. But God, according to his wisdom, he takes this gospel and he says, you know, it begins at the very bottom. It saves from the lowest of the low. It takes the one who is in the dunghill of sin and misery, who thinks to himself they have nothing, and no one in this world hath not God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith. You know, that's a concept which is so foreign and strange to most people. It's not how we work. Remember the how people used to choose football teams in school and probably still do the very same thing. I don't know about some of you here. Uh, I, I wasn't always chosen the first. I, I wasn't chosen the last, thankfully. Sometimes towards the end, but not always the last. And, and if it was rugby, then I put myself last. And I didn't want to, to do that. But it, it's it, life, isn't it? You have a selection of maybe Boys and girls, or young men and, and, and young women, and you choose the fastest, and you choose the most athletic, and the strongest, and the tallest, and, and all of these things, and the ones you think who are can actually do absolutely nothing towards winning in the game, well, they become last, and they get a complex as a result. It's not a, a good thing. We're, we're pretty cruel people, aren't we, uh, in, in humanity? That's the, that's the rule of life. People choose the best, they, they, the most intellectual are the ones who are elected to certain offices. The beauty and the beast concept is not in this world. It doesn't exist. But God chooses it. God chooses the beauty and the beast. He takes us in all of our beastly sin and all of our wickedness and he joins us to the beauty of Christ. And people look on and they say, well, what does that even mean? But that's the gospel. And that's what our, our Lord delights in. We know the words of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise, not many wise after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things. God hath chosen the weak things. That's what God chooses. Now, I, I sometimes have a different take on that verse. I think also it means the Lord renders someone who is also, who thinks they're mighty and noble to become weak and base. That's the pattern. That's the rule. Humble to be exalted. Theirs is the kingdom of God. And they become rich in faith. What a message to give to someone who might be vile in the appearance and have nothing to give. You know, if we people coming into our church who have nothing to give, nothing they can contribute in a f financial, physical way, we don't care. Because what we say is that that person has a richness in Christ. That's all that matters if they have him. 
And then just finally we see the, the corruption of the rich here. The, the rich and the rich, the individuals that James had in mind, these ungodly individuals, let's remember that these people that James has in mind here, they weren't men of God. We're not dealing with Christians in two divisions. We're dealing with unbelievers in general. That's what we're dealing with. Whether they're unsaved and they're filled with wealth or unsaved and filled with poverty. They're unsaved, but they come into the, the house of God. But these men of wealth, James is saying something to them. He's saying to believers, do you realize who you're favoring? Do you realize who you're favoring? You're, you're not favoring those who favor the gospel, but the very opposite. Verse 6. Do not rich men, that is these types of rich men, not all rich men. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats. Look at the, at the end of James 2 and verse uh, number 7. Do they, do they not blaspheme that worthy name by which ye are called? He reminds them that the very ones they're trying to scratch their back are the ones that stab other Christians in the back. Blaspheme the very name of God. He says you're respecting these people. So you see how partiality is more than just favouring someone above another. It is the applauding of the scores of the ungodly. And a rejecting of the very standards of God himself. And a blaspheming of the worthy name by which you are called. You wouldn't think that partiality could go that far, but it does. You wouldn't think it's possible to discriminate as a Christian to that extent, but you can. And all that we would regard against it with all our heart. I remind you again of verse 1. Have that faith of Christ. Don't have that profession of faith that is so contrary to Christ. But have the faith of Christ. May God bless you. His words to our hearts. Amen.